Everyone, if you could please take your seats. Um, so I want to welcome uh, Jeff Rush. He's a longtime software consultant and an organizer for the Dallas Python user group. Uh, and he's talked the magic of meta programming. So let's give Jeff a warm welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, very glad to be here with you this year. Uh, last year I was, I was scheduled to give this talk, but uh, the day before I came down with a flu and was, I spent the whole PyCon in my hotel room with a high fever. So this PyCon's turning out to be a lot better <laughs> than this. So this is about the magic of metaprogramming. That's uh, somewhat advanced technique. So what is metaprogramming? It's the writing of program code that writes, analyzes, or adjusts other code using that other code structure as its data. So there's two general forms of metaprogramming. Uh, there's manipulation from inside the program, which uh, stays in the production code, uh, and it reduces the developer workload. There's also the outside metacode metaprogramming, which is used for the debugging or uh, testing to insert test fixtures and such. So it makes use of meta classes, as you might expect from the name, uh, but it also uses decorators, attribute lookups of various types, and, uh, and the scriptures. Uh, this, this talk is only about Python 2x and the new style classes to keep it simple. Uh, so programming basically deals with, you know, we, our programs consist of code and data. And we have uh, computation so that the code is uh, operating on the data. And the code also responds to a user interface events, say. Uh, this is a traditional model of programming. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing up there. <laughs> AV guys? I'll back it up. Looks good on the monitor. <laughs> okay. It's a little fuzzy, but okay. Yeah. Okay, so. Traditional programs code in data, data compute reaches out to operate on the data, and it receives uh, uh, events, user interface events, perhaps. Uh, this is what you call conventional programming. So metaprogramming would have your meta code that uh, makes plumbing adjustments to the code. That's its data as the, as the other program's code. Uh, to do things like you know, adding attributes or adjusting their values, to uh, register elements with some central uh, repository or registry inside the program. Uh, to tag elements by placing additional attributes onto them to uh, uh, indicate something. And of course, the equivalent of the UI events would be code events. What kind of things would that be? It would be like when the, the, the import of a module would be an event in the system, in life of a program, uh, the definition of a class or function, the read writing of a dotted name attribute, and even calling and returning a, a function would be a, an event that we could operate upon. So. The above block is the, the meta, meta programming uh, side of things. So there's a certain amount of symmetry there. So a simple program. Uh, this was an example of a case where we had a uh, web server, and it had a uh, HTTP server class inside of it. And inside the same source file was the request object. And we, wanted to, uh, we needed to uh, subclass that request, but we didn't want to change any of the original source code. So, we wanted to subclass the class. They didn't use a public factory, so we couldn't just replace it in some uh, registry. Uh, they didn't import it from elsewhere, so we couldn't just swap out the file. Didn't take the class as a parameter. So the metaprogramming is we want to catch the import. At the moment that this, uh, this file is imported, we want to go in and, and scribble, rearrange things, so that we can redefine the request to be a subclass. So first thing you do is you want to uh, you want to basically uh, get yourself hooked into the import mechanism of the Python interpreter. So here we've stashed away the old uh, entry and, and added ourselves into the chain of, uh, of calls. And so we've defined our own import. And so whenever we're asked to import a certain module, we're going to go ahead and invoke the old one. Move that pointer out of the way. We're going to go ahead and invoke the actual import process because you want to hook the after import uh, operation. And then we're going to check to see what module was being imported. If it was importing, say, our web server, is what we were looking for. Uh, the, win the module uh, web server. Then we're going to rearrange that module, and then we're going to return the module. So it's been modified, but still the original web server module. 
So we'll reach back on the stack one level if we, if we wanted to be a little fancier. And we could actually inspect that uh, stack frame, and we could actually detect whether who's importing it. We don't have to do those three steps. You may just say that whenever this is imported, I want to modify it. But you may want to modify only when certain modules import it. And so you can actually uh, detect that and, and handle that optionally. So uh, this you know, rearranges it. So this is a repackaging of it on, uh, on GitHub. I have a towel.metaservices that gives you complete working examples of this. Uh, and so this sort of cleans it up a little bit. It's the same logic as before, but it's just a, a packaged a little bit better. So here we'd have an adjustment function over um, operating on a module. And we bring in the replacement uh, request class and modify the module to have that request class. And down in your main, you would have a uh, invoke the metaservices. We would say call after the import. And we want to call the web server. Uh, whenever the web server is imported, call the adjust function. And we want to only know about it if it's called from the startup.py file, the import. And then we just go ahead and run your main in your program. So this would be a very short way to, for a meta, meta program to insert itself by simply uh, put a, a, writing a new main that keeps most of the old main the same. And, uh, and it simply hooks into it. So this is if you want to hook into the import, of course, after it's come in. An alternate solution may be that you want to have more control. You want to actually be involved in the module. So we could actually uh, subclass the module. You don't often think about subclassing modules, but it's perfectly possible to do that. So here we have our import hook, and we still have the test for web server. And in the standard library, there is an iHooks uh, module that will let us uh, intervene in the, in the import process uh, in a more advanced way. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a defining a, a hook so that uh, whenever an import occurs, our hook will be invoked. And it will ask this hook to say, hey, someone is importing a module. Uh, I'm going to call a new module to say, give me an object. I don't care if it's a module or not. I need, I need an object that represents this, this thing that you're importing. So our, your module fixer is the new class, the new module that we want to use in place of the, of the, uh, uh, the, standard, of the, of the other module, the target module that's being modified. So, and we pass in the argument to it of uh, the name of the module that's being imported. And, uh, and then we call the loader. And so this basically causes it to, the, the import mechanism to say, every anytime someone imports that, I want to uh, slip out and give them a different object for that import. Don't, don't use the standard module. So what does, a, what does a subclass module look like? How would you do that? Uh, you basically pull into the types module and pull in module type and subclass it and give it a net to invoke the, the, the parent. And you have a, say here, a, a get attribute. And here we're going to uh, look up the module name. Whenever someone is looking it up, we're going to go get the, at, that attribute. And we're going to say print it out and say someone is, uh, is reaching into this module and is accessing a certain attribute. You could use that for lots of things. Uh, in this case, we want to say that if, if the module that's being imported is web server, and again, that request class that we're trying to substitute for, we're going to pull in from our replacements, and we're going to return that instead. So anytime someone asks for that, uh, it's going to get that instead. So it's like a property in that sense, and it's, you know, it's saying you're looking up a name. So the benefits of subclassing modules is that you can intercept uh, attributes, reads, and writes. So you could actually make some things read only. Uh, you can prevent or log the writes that occur whenever someone's invoking classes, invoking functions, talking to attributes inside a module. Uh, you can log timestamps, and you can actually look back on the stack and say, who's asking for this? Because sometimes you know that this function is being used incorrectly in a large mass of code, but you need to know which one is, uh, who's accessing it uh, out of this body of code. And you can also return different values, because if you know who's calling on the stack, you can actually return, a, uh, say, a test jig to this subsystem, but use the standard object on a different module. So you can give it different, different uh, aspects or views into that module. And just an aside, that, uh, some, some people who are new to, new to the import stuff doesn't, don't always realize that you can put all kinds of strange things onto the import path, and it can be useful sometimes for, uh, for you know, debugging or, or just playing around meta classes. So just, that's just an aside. OK. That's the first third of the talk. It's divided into three parts. So we take our breather here, and we switch gears. OK. So this is a little bit of history about how we got here for uh, for the younger people in the room, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the rise of objects, how we got here, is that uh, in the beginning there was a primordial ooze of, of bits that were coming together, crawling around out there in the world, uh, the ones and the zeros. And along came along data and code. We have variables and we have functions, or subroutines, as we used to call them. 
Uh, and they, they all lived together in the mass of, of your programs. And life was good, but a little bit confusing. So we decided to group them. So we, or you, you started to have the rise of the C-structs, or Pascal records, if you recall that. So we would group the variables into little namespaces, but we didn't group the functions at that stage. That, but the functions would reach out and touch these various uh, structs and, and reach these variables. And that was good. But we wanted to go a little further, so we actually promoted the, uh, the functions to actual variables and placed them inside these namespaces, as in C++ and others. And so now the things are nice and tidy. Uh, and these namespaces need to be constructed or assembled from things. And so we ended up having some kind of a constructor that produces these namespaces. Sometimes it, it was in a compiled language, it was simply in the compiler, but in general we have something that creates it. And so if we can create these namespaces of useful things, then suddenly you, you, the rise of the prototype pattern, where you build something tediously or carefully, craft it, and then you make copies of it. And uh, that was the, pro the rise of the prototype pattern. But it, it, it's a little bit weak still. So we got a little further. We can copy it out here. So we create instances of these, these, these objects. This saves labor. And uh, so that was the axis of creation, the sense of the timeline from originals to copies. So we're getting more advanced. And uh, we ended up also with uh, shared namespaces because these namespaces were getting a little bit crowded and there were common elements. You'll see that you know, the functions are duplicated in these objects. And so someone said, hey, we can do better than that. So let's have uh, shared and non-shared namespaces. And let's put things that are shared across all instances back in the top level namespace and uh, things that are specific to the instance down below. And that makes things smaller. Uh, and this was the rise of, an, of, of iterative lookup, because now it means that we can't simply look in a namespace. We have to look here, then look here. Maybe look here. And so we start uh, look at poking around and, and walking along namespaces. Uh, and this led to the, stu the stuff that things have in common lead to classes of things. So suddenly these shared things were the things that these instances had in common, and we would call that a class. And the other ones would become instances. So anyway, this is pretty obvious here. Uh, and then we have uh, the classes gained in excessive complexity, in, as, as always. And so uh, we decided to have a longer lookup chain. And uh, so now you suddenly have classes of classes. So now you can then have the inheritance, the addition of inheritance to the picture. And uh, then we go further. And uh, this, this added the axis of inheritance in contrast to the axis of creation. And then we had multiple inheritance and the, uh, the multiple parent classes to say, well, let's, you know, we can package things a little bit better. And then their idea was, well, who's making the classes? Let's make life easier. So we have the meta class, which would create the class. And it got a little more complicated because now the classes are pointing to their creations and the instances are pointing to their namespaces. And so we, uh, but, but it makes the division of labor, division of, uh, of data much, much better. And then someone said, uh, okay, so medication, meta classes took over the creation responsibilities for the classes. They, they basically construct those namespaces. So before we had the creation function spread out, now we got them uh, merged into the meta class. And it was the type. And uh, now you can subclass your own meta class. Now most meta classes are uh, pretty simple. I mean, you know, there's only you know, one, one type of class, but uh, if you wanted to subclass it, you can get, uh, get fancier. So, a meta class implements a kind of a class. So almost always, you only need one. You can go through your whole programming life never needing a meta class. Uh, it creates a new kind of a class, new kind of thing. Uh, and it basically makes smarter classes. Today, the class is pretty much a container of methods. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty simple, and you may have a need for something fancier. We'll see what one might be. Uh, new kinds are useful for um, wrapping complexity for other programmers to use. Maybe you have uh, junior and senior programmers. The seniors create uh, more of a complex class that uh, does some things automatically for them, and the junior engineers use those. So like a DSL, domain-specific language. Uh, maybe you want to generate uh, some of the content of the class dynamically by looking it up over a, a serial protocol or a database retrieval. Uh, meta classes don't directly affect the, name, the instance's namespace lookup. That's controlled by the class. Method resolution order is not in there, and the scripter retrieval is not in meta classes. So meta classes are, are uh, very focused on uh, constructing that initial namespace. So one example of that is, say, we have a, a member, uh, member uh, class and points back to a meta class, and all we're going to do is we're going to have a, uh, specify that the d database table is the member's uh, S SQL table, and that actually is an input to the meta class. And that's all the class has in it, and 
So now we can create the meta class down here, and you pass in the name bases and class dictionary, and we say we're going to in some way connect to a relational database. We're going to look up the column definitions, so we know the columns in the table, or the, we know their names, we know their types, and say so we retrieve them for the table passed in, and we're going to loop over that, and we're going to create attributes inside of the new class, inside of the uh, the uh, member class. And so we're going to give them uh, uh, various uh, name. We're going to give them a name and a default value, maybe some uh, other protection. And so the idea was that by uh, using this meta class, we were able to change the DB table equal members, which is a human readable declaration, into machine friendly code down below, which is uh, harder to understand. So maybe we wanted to wrap that attribute. And so we could get into a wrapping a column uh, definition to read write. So we can say we're going to get the value and uh, pull the attribute out of the dictionary. There's a set, and uh, so we can actually intercept those. So the get is simply passing it through. The, uh, the set DB column is actually validating the value. So we're, we're also going to make sure that if you set this attribute, we're going to make sure that it's a proper type. So if you're setting it, if it's an integer column, you can't set it to a string. And then return a property. So this is a simple example of a, of a little wrapper that you might place over an attribute. Here, you know, with value constraints. Uh, another thing meta classes can do would be uh, check classes for conformance so that they can walk over the class and say, you know, uh, company policy, everything must have a doc string, method names must be uh, camel case but not underscores, uh, maximum inheritance step, they can actually look at the parent structure and say, no, this class exceeds four levels, or it's against our policy or coding convention. Uh, and it can ensure that certain abstract methods, they can look at the specific class and say, these are abstract and you did not implement them, so you're going to have a problem. Meta classes are useful for those kinds of things to check you. What about class decorators? Came along later. And the latter are much simpler to do. They can do almost everything the former can do, except there's some differences. Only a meta class can add methods to the class itself. So it's a little trickier. Class level sock sections are, uh, if you had used the class methods decorator for class, that class decorator, that provides them to the instances. Uh, meta classes methods provide them to the class itself. So you can actually have methods that are only available to the class logic, not to the instance logic. Uh, only a meta class can uh, add, add to the class attributes things not visible to self. So this would be things that you could not even get to via self, and they're outside the uh, lookup chain. And that can be useful for certain class methods that you want to uh, make the class smarter, more powerful. Uh, class decorators can be more easily stacked. Stacking meta classes is, 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 is tricky to make them work correctly. So that's a good thing for class decorators. Uh, class decorators are not inherited, however. So uh, if you provide that, uh, decorate something, it won't be uh, handled by the subclass. So just an example of that, here we have two classes, and uh, one, the left one is going to be a, a, dec a class decorator, and the right one's going to be a meta class. Very similar, they have this attribute called special equal true, uh, just uh, something you want to look up. And so we can actually query that and say, okay, we've made one of these, and say, alpha, do you have the special attribute? They're both true, sure, okay. But then we uh, inherit to a subclass, and then we ask it, does it have it? The, uh, the one that used the class decorator on the left uh, is, uh, does not have that attribute. It's not in the lookup chain. So that's just a, a distinction if you need that. So meta classes can be useful or uh, essential for uh, if you want in to support inheritance of your, uh, of your actual extra value. Uh, another example of them would be, a uh, class decorator here, would be if you wanted to uh, uh, log the arguments in return of uh, the method calls of all the, cl all the methods in a class. So we could decorate that with a trace calls class decorator. And say so we have an object called paragraph that uh, prints a lead-in of asterisks. And it returns a count of those characters. And we want to uh, basically wrap that method so that we can see the arguments going in and see the return value without having to go in and modify that, uh, that method very closely. We can just place this decorator on the class and all the methods will be taken care of, including ones inherited from uh, parents. So we would call it, we would call the lead in, and it would print out and say, okay, you've called this method, you got these arguments, and uh, you returned these arguments. So how does, how does it do that? Uh, so defining a class decorator, you say trace calls takes an argument of the class and returns the class at the bottom, so it doesn't modify, it does not uh, replace the class, it simply modifies it. Uh, here we have my get attribute, we're going to give it a new get attribute so we can actually see what's going in. Uh, and we're going to hook it in, so the, the class get attribute uh, hooks us into that uh, the get attribute lookup methods. And in our, when, we're, when we're looking up an attribute, we're going to go and call it and actually return what the attribute would have been. So that's a pass through in that sense so far. But uh, the next step is key. Uh, if it's not callable, if it's just a data variable that we're looking up, 
we're going to go ahead and return it. If it's callable, which means it's a method, because we want to wrap methods, that's the purpose of this, of this decorator, is to wrap all the methods, okay? Then we're going to place a wrapper around it called the call tracer, and we're going to return that for the attribute lookup instead. So the data variables are passed through, anything callable gets wrapped. The wrapper, down below, is, takes in the function that it's wrapping, and uh, returns a uh, function, the wrapper around the function, that says when called, here's the arguments, invoke the function, and then say log the arguments in the return code, and then return the code. So it's simply uh, wrapping it, but doesn't change anything of the operation. Uh, the last one is using, uh, you know, uh, 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 I forgot the word. Anyway, the right one is, used, is, is an identical way of doing it, but it's, uh, it's, it's done as a class instead of a uh, closure. Yes, the left one is a closure, which can be sometimes harder to understand for people. And the right one is exactly the same, but does it with the class. And so here we, here we simply have the, the, cl the call tracer, and uh, we have the, the underscore underscore call method that uh, you see the same logic there. So whichever one, they both work, depends on which one you uh, find easier to implement. Okay, that's the end of the second half. <coughs> second, third. Uh, and uh, so the next one is how look at going into how decorators work, because we've been playing with them a little bit here. And uh, so how does, that, how does Python's attribute lookup even work? Okay, there, there's a function called underscore underscore get attribute, which takes the name. This is sort of a symbolic representation of the logic, because that way it fits on one slide. And if it doesn't find it, it returns attribute error. So what's inside there? We're going to go to the instance, and we're going to look up the name. And if it's not there, we're going to have a missing value. Uh, if it's not missing, we're going to return that. So it's looking up the data. Uh, then we're going to go through looking through the dictionaries that are stacked up for this, for this class. We're going to go looking through the parent space and see if it's over there, and class, ver class variables. And if it's not missing, we're going to return that. And if that's not there, then we're going to go and look through the dictionary of the, uh, of the parents and go looking for those for the method. And uh, if it's not missing, then we're going to return the method with that, wrapped with that name. Otherwise, we're going to return get attribute error. So that's the basic logic simplified. So we look at the data, we're looking for the methods. Uh, when you want to look, use, when to use it, uh, if you want to use every, see every attribute lookup on a class, you would use the get attribute. You don't always want to look at every one because it has a performance overhead. But if you wanted to, you could do that. Uh, if you want to use many of them, but not every one of them, use your get adder, because there are some lookups that bypass get adder. Uh, and so uh, you, you do that. Uh, doesn't see all because it's only called as the last resort. You saw back up here, the, uh, the get adder up here on the last example, see? So it's, uh, it only calls the get adder if it doesn't already exist in the uh, dictionary. So back to where we were. Uh, if you want to do one attribute lookup, then you'd place a descriptor into the class. And that's quite common. Uh, for, then there's, this, of course, the set attribute. And uh, that would be overriding a storing value into the, uh, into the actual dictionary and delete attribute. So those are the three that we have. Overriding the get attribute. Uh, say we have a wrapper around a bitmap element and uh, with a width and a height internally. And supposedly internally, it measures it in pixels. Uh, but externally, it's measured as inches, and we want a decorator, uh, uh, a descriptor, to handle this, uh, this mismatch in our interface between the usage and, and its design. So say we have a page bitmap, and it returns a representation of in inches. You, you see that at the bottom, it does self.width, self.height. So those have to be measured as, in, uh, as uh, inches. So the get attribute takes the name in and says, if the name is width, uh, go look up the actual value in my dictionary and uh, convert it from uh, pixels or dots to inch. And there's also one for height. And, uh, and if not, then you return an attribute saying, I don't have that attribute. It's not, not here. And there's a similar one you have to add for the, the set to handle that. And that works, but if you start doing this very much, suddenly your get adder and set adder start getting into complex code. So the descriptors are uh, an alternative to that. With a descriptor, we have the same class and the representation. And uh, we place into, as a class attribute, the descriptor. And there's a descriptor called dimension inches. And the name of the attribute is called width in the string there, because the descriptor needs to know what name it is. And we have one for the height. And that's all we have to do. That much, that's much simpler than having a get set with a list of things. Uh, and also, it lets you factor out the, uh, the look at the conversion operation. Before, the conversion operation was in the class. And now it's actually over in the descriptor, which could be a library of useful uh, descriptors. What does a descriptor look like? 
It's a subclass of objects that takes the init, so it stores away, it's, it's the name of the attribute it represents. And then whenever the descriptor is asked for the, uh, uh, the instance, it uh, looks it up in the dictionary, and then in this case does the calculation and changes it to, uh, to inches. And then it also has a, a set. So we can use that descriptor to uh, uh, make things much simpler for the page class, even though it's a little more, you know, a little more, a little more for the dimension inches class. So that's, uh, that's a benefit of the descriptor. Oops. I'm running out of time. I'll, I'll go into the question time a little bit to finish up. Uh, so here we go back into the more complex attribute lookup. And so we have the, this is actually the Python class. So we go through and um, look up the, uh, go through the look up the dictionary, look up the instance, and we put some more stuff in here. Let's see. And I have time to cover this, regrettably. Yeah. So what is a descriptor again? Let's go to that sort of code. It's an object you place into the class attributes. It's a plug-in to the lookup mechanism. So it's a, you know, think of it as a plug-in. Uh, it's shared by all instances. They all have the same. Uh, and it's recognized by having a get method, not by any particular class that it subclasses from. So merely by having that, it can be a binding, uh, as it's called, a binding behavior. Uh, it doesn't know its name, so it's reusable. So we use the same, one, cl same class for both width and height. Didn't have, you know, it doesn't have to know its name. And it's for one attribute. It can store its value inside the instance dictionary, perhaps in different names, which is what we, you know, we were storing it inside. But it could store it in some other place, say a registry. It could be a, a virtualization of uh, some repository of information. Or it could just compute it. And uh, where are the scriptures used today? We're basically using them as method objects. We use them for class methods and static in order to uh, rearrange the arguments to the functions by placing a self, class, or nothing. That's a useful place for descriptors. We have properties, which uh, gives you pro programmatic access over the attributes of getting, setting, and deleting. And for internal recalculation, so that you can actually do caching of laser values. The first time you access an attribute, it computes the value or loads it. Ever, ever thereafter, it uh, uh, uses that cached value. So here's a quick example of that. So we have a photo class, thumbnails, and uh, we want to you know, compute this, uh, speed this up. So we, pay, you know, we have the uh, thumbnail builder, which is a, the, the descriptor, takes in a name, and a a uh, attribute name, and a, function, a file name. And we'll give it a git. And we'll read the in image in, and we'll store it into the dictionary when the git occurs. And we'll place the uh, descriptor into the photo class. Now thumbnail is now a cached attribute. And so now we'll uh, look it up instead of looking up the going to the descriptor. You can also make the, I'll just go over this real fast. This lets you make a uh, attribute private to a class. Basically, by uh, placing a check into the class, you can actually look back on the frame and say, who's asking for this attribute? If, it doesn't, if it's not it's called, uh, being asked by somebody with the self attribute, uh, deny access to it. And so you can actually implement the private, like C++ in the, in the Python if you really needed to do that. Or you could log the access if you were trying to track down a complex problem. And changing, uh, checking classes, you can also use descriptors for uh, check, tracking the stack. So we can actually change it. Every time you change an attribute, we could actually place it into a history table, uh, a history list, so that you can actually, at the end of your program, dump out uh, how is this variable changed, saying that you know, this variable is changed to five by module so-and-so line four, then it was changed to a four, then it was changed to a three. And you can dump it out and say, okay, this function shouldn't even be talking to this attribute. You, know, you can see that in the log then, and you can actually say he shouldn't be accessing it. Everybody else's access was, was acceptable. So that's the kind of things you can do with, with descriptors. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nice, I think. And that's all. Uh, okay. <laughs>